thank you very much for joining us in this session. Um, we, my name is Russell Hutchinson. I'm the Director of Quality Product Research, or at least the one on the stage. And uh, I, yeah, we really appreciate you coming along. I've got a fantastic panel. I'm going to get them to introduce themselves in just a moment. Before I do that, a couple of things um, to kick off. Um, first of all, are you familiar with the system for asking questions? So if you've had a go at it already, great. If you haven't, use this as an opportunity. Uh, we've, got some, we've got good time available to us today. We'd love to have your questions on this very interesting subject. And uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to use that, nudge your neighbour, get them to put your question through for you, that's fine too. And we will do our best to make sure that we get through that list. So um, my kids say my Tara is pretty awful, but I'm going to give it a go. Kia ora tato, ko Russell Hutchinson, taku ingoa, ke Quality Product Research Limited, aho i Mahiana, no England, Scotland, aku tupuna, tēnā koutou katoa. And um, now I'm going to pass over to the first of our panel to introduce themselves. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Appreciate you all coming out to the session. I'm Mike Hobbs, uh, and I'm the Head of Claim Approvals for Southern Cross Health Society. Um, we have a fairly vested interest in, in the outcome of the conversation today around genetics and its application and insurance. And I think really we have an ambition to uh, provide services that ensure uh, Kiwis can live their healthiest lives and uh, ensure the well-being of all New Zealanders. And uh, I guess our focus is on how we can uh, manage and support the use of genetics as it relates to health insurance, but equally maintain an environment that supports uh, equitable access to insurance and make sure that is sustainable and affordable. Uh, for all of our members. So uh, we've certainly got some views about how it interacts with our business as it stands today and what they could look like in the future. So look forward to having a conversation with you all. Thank you. I'm Ingrid Thorne and I look after life insurance underwriting for Swiss Re, based in Australia but am a Kiwi. And what I enjoy about this topic, um, very similar to what Mike says, but from the life insurance perspective, but also like to see it as an opportunity to ultimately get better health outcomes. Uh, insurance does play an important part of the broader health ecosystem and we need to, to remember to keep that in front of mind. Uh, thank you. My name is Dr Rob Young. Uh, I'm here wearing three hats. Uh, one, I work at the Auckland Hospital uh, and I also work at the University of Auckland uh, and I'm also a medical advisor ind independently to the insurance industry. My comments today reflect none of those organisations, I might add. They're personally, they're just my personal view after being in the industry and in wearing those three hats for about the last 25 years. Uh, I'd like to see a, a vigorous but balanced debate about how genetic testing should be regulated going forward. It's clear New Zealand is behind other countries in the world. It's clear we need to act. Uh, just how we do that is really the discussion uh, and I'm finding it so far compli complicated but hopefully there'll be a little bit of clarity out of today. Fantastic, thank you for that. Uh, last year, we had a brilliant panel discussion led by Nick Kerwin. Rob was our unofficial fifth member of the panel. I think you were sitting over there. Um, we thought we'd better get you on the stage this time, actually hear from you. Uh, but it, a lot has happened between last year and now. In fact, some things even happened yesterday, which we might unpack a little bit later on in our session, but would, would, can I ask you, Rob, first of all, just to take us through some of the things that have gone on over that period of time? Thank you. Yes. Maybe I'll even go back a little bit further than that, share a little bit of my personal history, but also reflecting on key components of this story, genetics, insurance, and how do they fit together. Uh, so a long time back, and I'm talking in the late 80s, I was overseas studying in the, a research group in Oxford looking at the genetics of asthma. At that time, they had described and had identified the first genes for Huntington's disease, cystic fibrosis, and the BRCA genes came soon after. Uh, and that was really uh, some time back, and there was a lot of hope about what that would mean in terms of the utility of genetic testing, predicting outcomes for people, improving their care. Uh, in the interim, there's been a lot gone on in genetics and it's become more complicated, not less. Uh, we realise we have a human genome, we realise we can sequence it down to individual letters, so you may have a book full of letters. However, the, the, there are not very clear sentences, we can't distinguish most of the words, and in summary, 
the, the large, vast majority of the genetic code that you each carry, which is unique to you, is still a complete unknown to the scientific and medical community. And the little gems, the little nuggets uh, that have been discovered already, which are these genes, which are related to certain outcomes, are very limited uh, in the whole knowledge base. Genetics is going to um, develop very rapidly. We now have a new science called genomics, which involves much more than just genetic code. Uh, and this, again, is being looked at in terms of its ability to improve outcomes for people. My comment is, is that it is evolving rapidly. And my concern is if we set in place blanket bans on things, we have no ability to adapt, to move, to change, and to recognise what that information means. Uh, so really we have just these few little nuggets on a big field of genetic code that we really do not yet understand and may not understand uh, even in the coming decades and even with AI. Now coming to the insurance perspective, uh, again I have a long history in insurance and at the time I started in the insurance area I, already w was, I was already wearing a genetics hat if you like and at that stage there was a moratoria um, that was recognised by New Zealand from ABI uh, which is the um, Association of British Insurers, which already had some regulation around the requirement to undergo genetic testing in the context of insurance. Things have moved rapidly. Countries have introduced various regulatory approaches to this issue, recognising that genetic discrimination is an issue. The debate, though, is, is discrimination unfair or fair use of genetic information? And that is a, a more complicated story, and I won't attempt to address that right now, but to say that within the insurance industry, pressure has now come on in New Zealand uh, to really get up to speed with some form of regulatory uh, body and, and approach to handling genetic information in the provision of insurance services. And that's what brings us here today. So last year, as uh, Russell has said, this was an initial um, panel and it involved a folk from the genetic testing community. Uh, there's been work published in this area and a colleague of mine, Andrew Schelling, has uh, done some interesting and very relevant research in this area and together with others have formed a very strong lobby group uh, that have uh, lobbied government to bring genetic testing onto the table of discussion and around increasing regulation and the use of results. And that has really been a kind of summary of really what has happened here. Uh, and now we have, as of yesterday, uh, the first indication from the government as to how they propose to uh, deal with this, how they want to handle this, uh, really the results of that initial lobbying. Uh, and to just put a little bit of context in this, I've made two submissions, both as an independent person with an interest in the oversight and overview of this area and with my interest as an academic, which is about sharing information so that people are, uh, have balanced information when they undergo or are about to undergo genetic testing and that genetic counselling and the genetic testing community have a greater understanding of the process of insurance and provision of insurance products. Uh, and so I, I'm here with the agenda of greater clarity, transparency, uh, certainly greater outcomes, better outcomes for patients. Uh, and so there is my summary. Yeah, that's fantastic. And um, I, gu I guess, uh, you know, there's one of our aims here, and I think Michael summed it up really well when we were preparing for this session, was that what we want are the best possible outcomes for customers. And the FSC is here to promote the best possible outcomes for all of our customers. And um, some of them might be contemplating seeking a genetic test, and some of them are current policyholders. And you know they all have you know concerns or they have a they have a stake in, in the debate so to speak. Uh, but can I ask you just briefly to summarise you know what the issue would be for a consumer contemplating obtaining a genetic test and the issue for their insurance eligibility? Just to make sure that we have that voice of that customer here in the room. Okay, I, I have to uh, disclose I, I my patients don't have genetic testing done, and there's not a, that's not because I don't believe in it, but because it's just a different branch of medicine. And my hat with genetics is more of a research hat. But to try and answer the question, Russell, that you pose, if an individual has insurance in place, then any test that they undergo has no bearing on that insurance adversely. Uh, certainly, and so that that contract is established. It's based on information disclosed at policy commencement date, 
And so subsequent testing, whether it's genetic or anything, uh, really um, becomes a secondary issue, not in terms of their health, but in terms of their coverage at that time. The more vexing issue, I think, is those who have not got insurance cover, who have a family history of concern, perhaps, or have some concerns about their risk. They see the opportunity to undergo genetic testing, and then the question arises, if I undertake this test, what are the implications? And although not everybody is 100% happy with uh, one recommendation, which would be, well, put your insurance in place and then get your genetic test. And that's one response and it's not necessarily satisfactory for everybody, but that is an approach. My concern and what I've seen from the material and the studies that were well, study published by Andrew and his group was that there's a large gap on the part of genetic counsellors and their understanding of the implications of what they're advocating in an insurance context. And that troubles me and I think we need to close that gap uh, as a group, uh, and so that's one of the key things for me. And completing our uh, sort of view of the lie of the land, and turning now to Ingrid, if that's okay, uh, uh, thinking about what the industry has done, both uh, here in New Zealand and in Australia, maybe in, in a couple of parts, what has the industry done, and, and what have you seen perhaps in Australia that's worked well and not so well, if you'd like to give us that? Well, I will start here and how we come together as we are part of the FSC working group uh, that is looking at, at how we can respond. Um, and we do have the genetic counsellors. We usually have two. We have Dr Andrew Schillings in the room and the advocates and we have really open conversations to help us understand. And you see the penny drop moments. They, what they think they know, what we think we know, um, and we really just have started to lift that conversation and be able to find the points that are important that we understand. One of the really early things that we realise we all have in common, because I think that's important for any working group, is that we do want people to have those better health outcomes. So that is where we, we meet, and you can imagine conversations get heated. It's an emotive topic. People in the room here, you will know someone who's had, having, thinking, and you desperately want to ask the insurers what we would do, um, because that's, it is, it's a, it's a topic of interest. Um, so I think what I liked and what I saw yesterday were the words, they said, we'll take a cautious approach and we'll do it under consultation, which is really complementary to the work that the FSC has done to date on this. Now with Australia, and, and look, I could throw to Nick, um, where we started um, and Nick led the piece of work which was the initial genetics moratorium in Australia and, and more recently in the last 12 months uh, we have, there's a submission um, with Treasury still waiting to hear what the outcome will be. Uh, the options on the table will be a complete ban. Um, a partial ban similar to what the UK does, which allows the use of some tests, um, or just to sort of increase the sums insured that would be available to, to people under the existing moratorium. So we are still in a, in a I guess, a position of, of flux, and I know that we are in New Zealand looking at, at what does happen and, and what outcomes uh, that will lead to. And you, you mentioned the working group. I, I want to say thank you very much to Kate Drom for her work around that. Uh, she's away right now. I'm, I'm kind of in her chair, so to speak. So, um, But uh, I know that that discovery has been real. Like a, a lot of the comments I heard from Kate were that, you know, it was fascinating to learn more about the subject. And there's a few good questions coming through. Um, perhaps just as a little bit in terms of Oh, we're going to get on to the piece around what was announced yesterday in a mo. We'll get to, uh, get to unpack that in a second. But um, Michael, can you give us an update on how health insurance perhaps differs to life insurance in this process, and you know how testing could influence the availability of coverage and so on? Yes, I, I can. Thank you. And I think probably it's important to distinguish that. Uh, whenever we're looking at legislation, certainly some of the advocacy coming through, it's important that we just don't bundle insurance as one package and recognise there are similarities, certainly, but differences by type of insurance as well. Um, some of the similarities between life and health insurance, for argument's sake, is we abide by similar criteria around we won't ask applicants to undertake genetic testing for the purposes of applying for or obtaining health insurance or life insurance. Uh, we won't take someone else's test and apply terms to the applicant as a consequence of that in lieu of their own testing. Uh, we both share trauma products, which are, tend to be lump sum products. 
Um, uh, and, and certainly in the case of health insurance, we offer some that provide a lump sum payment in the hundreds of thousands of dollars for qualifying diagnosis. Um, and so, of course, it's uh, imperative to us if someone is joining into that policy and has a predisposition for developing that qualifying diagnosis, we would want to know about that. Um, and if we take a very common genetic defect, which most in the room may be familiar with, BRCA2 gene defect, what we know is that uh, persons with that gene defect are up to five to seven times more likely than population average to develop breast cancer, um, and anywhere from eight to 12 per cent uh, or higher, uh, 17 to 22 per cent in some studies likely to develop ovarian cancer as a consequence of it. So we just need to be careful uh, when looking and assessing at someone's risk that we're just not introducing them blindly that can have adverse claims effect that actually challenge the sustainability of the product for all members uh, on a scheme. Um, that's where the similarities are. Where the differences start to emerge, uh, if we think about the ultimate risk profile of life insurance, we're really concerned about someone's mortality. Um, and so actually there might be quite some merit in encouraging the uptake of testing so that people can be aware of their predisposition, uh, pursue increased monitoring so they can have early diagnosis of developed conditions, enabling earlier treatment, and by proxy that should support greater health outcomes longer, and li uh, longer life. Right? Uh, lower or lessen that mortality rate. So it can actually have some really good influence and outcome for life insurance as an industry. For health insurance, I guess we're probably less concerned about the finality of it and more about the quality of it as it persists. Um, and so that is access to care and treatment throughout a member's lifetime. Um, for a genetic defect in itself, there's not a lot of treatment that exists really in New Zealand at the moment for those, apart from consultations and screening, testing. Um, but we do look at overseas territories and we see uh, the emergence of CAR T-cell therapy, uh, which starts at upwards of $500,000. Um, we see um, uh, we've seen gene editing uh, treatment, which can actually remove defective gene and replace it with productive gene, uh, and that's upwards of $750,000 per treatment. So there are some considerations under a health insurance lens that we want to ensure that we can provide a policy that maintains access to treatment, that supports great outcomes, but do so in a fashion that is obviously sustainable and that the remainder of our membership are willing to pay for, because of course uh, claims translate into premium. Um, so we do need to be aware of that. I, I would say in health insurance, the industry has actually been looking at this issue for a number of years, uh, and there's a few aspects within cover already today that help support patients. Um, you know, with uh, gene defects live uh, a full and healthy life. And an example of that may be if someone were to um, uh, be diagnosed with a genetic defect after joining that predisposed them towards development of breast cancer, uh, we do have policy uh, benefits that allow for a mastectomy, so risk-reducing mastectomy, prophylactic treatment, uh, so they can uh, undertake that treatment to lower their risk of developing a subsequent cancer. Um, an oophorectomy to remove ovaries for the same risk basis. Um, and beyond that, uh, in health treatment, if someone were to undertake, uh, or be diagnosed with a cancer and want to undertake chemotherapy treatment, uh, the use of prognostic genetic testing to help ascertain their receptiveness to a particular drug. Um, so there are benefits within policy as well, and I think the balance that we're trying to strike is, um, if we offer those benefits, how do we then mitigate the use to only those that are uh, unknown uh, at the point in joining? Otherwise, we do run that risk of anti-selection, people joining in order to qualify for a treatment uh, and the potential risk of dis uh, discontinuance of the policy thereafter. So that's some of the considerations that we do face uniquely in health that don't necessarily persist into other uh, insurance industries. No, it was a good summary. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, and that brought in the view of the current consumer as somebody for whom we wish to deliver good, sustainable outcomes as well, which is important. Uh, can I? Um, I've got several good questions now which we can turn to, perhaps as a part of the lay of the land um, discussion. Uh, so one of these is, uh, what impact will AI have on the development of genetics in the sector? Looking at you, Rob, you up for that? Actually, it sounds like Michael could answer that question. He's actually had some experience. I'll, I'll hand the microphone over to him in a second. Uh, but uh, AI is, of course, an unknown element uh, in terms of medical research and predictive algorithms. Uh, that's the goal, is to put together a whole bunch of variables that you hadn't thought of before or hadn't figured out how to put together in your risk algorithm. So I think it may help unravel some of the complexities of the human genome and their impact on people's ultimate health. 
really we know a lot about environment and environment is still a massive factor in outcomes for people and, and accelerated aging and early disability. So for all this information, how that will actually apply, um, I think remains to be seen. Uh, thanks, Rob. I don't have uh, a lot to add, uh, aside from to say, I guess the benefit of, of uh, AI technology as it's introduced is just its capability to synthesise large volume of data um, and understand trends or lead indicators that may eventuate into claims downstream. And so, you know, certainly within uh, the health society, we're looking at, uh, you know, testing that can help ascertain um, potential risk before developed conditions uh, come about. And so, uh, we can we know a lot about a one of our members' journeys through health. We see every time they claim for a consultation, uh, imaging, and subsequent treatment, and to try and use that data to produce some insight into people like me, what I might expect, um, or even uh, as a trigger for referral. So I think that some of that future of health. Uh, view we're looking to leverage technology for, but it's certainly, uh, you know, a, a very fast developing field. I, I heard once from uh, a consultancy that the power of generative AI is developing at 10,000 times, um, you know, per month, which is astronomical in terms of a number. But I think its uh, its cap capability and use in, in health and life insurance is probably just very, uh, very much at the early stages. I was just going to add too, though, we do need to be mindful that with both AI and genetics, getting down to these really granular individual levels takes us away from the pools of risk. And it really could, that, that is, I guess, our fundamental piece. So it's finding that balance between what is the point where we say this much risk is tolerable, it fits within the pricing, we can give it much more broadly than we can if we get down to sort of the price for the individuals. Maybe staying with you, Ingrid, um, I, I've got a question which says, as a reinsurer, I'm assuming they mean you, um, how do you appraise risk, uh, sorry, how do you appraise risk or not of the information asymmetry between customers who undertake a private genetic test, highlighting disease risk, influencing anti-selection and insurers not privy to this information? Well, in both Australia and New Zealand, private genetic testing is quite difficult to get. So it, what they do is it's, there's a limited number of providers. So I look at it and go, quite fortunate, not a problem I have to really think about today. Um, but it's not to, to cut out, and I do look to the, our colleagues overseas, particularly in the US, where you've got the likes of your 23 and me. Um, but as a, as a global reinsurer, we look to those kinds of tests, and they're much more about like predispositions, right? What we're, what we're talking about here are where we have actual specific genes which we know have perhaps a diagnosis attached to it or just a, perhaps just a predictive you could develop, right? So we're not trying to complicate it with those pieces. So again, what we know in the general population, well, I, I guess if you think of it this way, the number of people that have the conditions is not changing because of genetics, right? So the absolute numbers don't change, so we have what we didn't know already within our premiums. Ultimately, we could make the premium cheaper if we had more of this knowledge, and perhaps that's where the future can take us when we get better health outcomes. But at the moment, it's really trying to work out in our risk assessment, let's put that person against everyone in the pool and see what we need to do to protect against the risk. Nice, thank you. Um, another one of the questions from the floor is, uh, oh, it's just moved around. We're speaking about genetics, but the application in real risk and treatment lies with proteomics. Is there thinking on how to deal with that in insurance? <laughs> it's clearly Rob's, yeah. Okay, someone's been reading late at night. Um, <laughs> So proteomics is a whole new branch of science and really it looks at people's protein profiles in their blood usually uh, to try and make predictions about you know, health outcomes. Uh, and I've been watching the proteomics space with wearing my kind of genetics genomics hat with some interest and one of the things that uh, occurred or it became clear to me was that your proteomic profile probably changes several hundred times in the day depending on what you've eaten, depending on what you're doing, depending on what you've been taking by way of medication or anything else. And so you've got such a wealth of information that's rapidly changing, how that's going to provide an average or long-term risk or give you insights, for me, is a difficult one. 
Proteomics may be great in understanding a cancer that's getting away, that's getting uh, advanced, that's metastasizing, a cancer that's responding to treatment. Uh, and a lot of the fancy assays that are now being developed, DNA assays, RNA assays, are really designed to look at this, and they may have fantastic utility in that setting. But I'm still remain to be convinced that these newer branches of these microsciences are going to impact at a population level that Ingrid's talked about uh, across an industry such as insurance. Uh, I'm still doubtful. Um, from a health, health insurance perspective, there's probably just one consideration, and that is uh, with any genetic defect that, that is identified uh, through disclosure to us, our exclusions would limit, uh, be limited to just the genetic defect in itself. And so we're really concerned with future treatment uh, for gene editing, as I mentioned, uh, or consultations, treatment, or scan, uh, imaging upon that defect itself. We still cover conditions that you may develop as a consequence of that predisposition. And it's one of the reasons that we don't look into this field is because actually uh, this, there's not really uh, a great scope of known treatment for it. And if you develop the condition, we're looking to fund that anyway. So actually, it's the materiality of the disclosure. And I think, uh, and as we'll talk about shortly under the contracts uh, of insurance bill, it's really around uh, our interest of obtaining information which is relevant to the underwriting decision for which we're asking to obtain it. And I have an underwriting question. I'm just going to kind of uh, try and word this so that we're talking about, I suppose what we're really asking about is, you know, if we have uh, genetic test disclosures, you know, to what extent might, you know, given that, you know, we've got fairly limited kind of approaches in terms of underwriting, in terms of the responses that we have in underwriting, like exclusions and loading buckets and so on, um, is it really going to deliver significantly different outcomes to what we do already in terms of looking at family history and predispositions amongst family history and so forth? So it, does it really deliver anything markedly different from that, do you think? Um, for health underwriting, uh, I probably refer to my previous answer, to be honest. In, in short, not a lot. Um, it's more around uh, ensuring that we're not inadvertently funding things that we otherwise didn't intend for a known predisposition. Um, but to that effect, because we still cover developed conditions, that's really uh, w where the primary impact would lay. So if I had a predisposition for developing breast cancer, it's the mastectomy, it's the chemotherapy related to that, which is our primary concern. So not so much in trauma insurance, most certainly, because it's around the qualifying diagnosis and the likelihood of you to receive that diagnosis, which is where the claim's born. I think that probably has quite a significant impact in that field. And so for life underwriting, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, if you look to, to Canada, and that was mentioned, they actually don't use genetic testing for good as well. So they just rule it out completely. But what we, what we do in Australia and New Zealand is if you have your family history you disclose, you say, but I've had the genetic test and I'm not going to inherit that condition, then you can be a standard rates risk, right? So there is that, that counter to it. So it can actually improve the terms that can be offered. Uh, but we don't look at it blatantly. We also look at why someone is having a genetic test. Is it because they want to be part of a clinical trial? Again, improving health outcomes. Is it because they have some symptoms and they're actually going down that path because it could be that they're gonna be diagnosed with that condition? Or is it solely off the family history? So it's never that one size fits all approach. And we do have some limited outcomes. Uh, we ultimately are trying to get the cover, uh, but it can also be a reviewable situation as well, right? Perhaps there's future prophylactic surgery or treatment where we can always look to see if we can improve the terms during the lifetime of the policy. Nice. Um, but there's another question which you know talks about, you know, obviously as a, as a sector, we're interested in this subject, but really how big is the actual consumer demand? both here, and I know you spoke a little bit about that earlier, but maybe also in comparison to other jurisdictions. So maybe are we just a bit behind the curve and we're gonna see more of this type of issue arise, maybe both from you, Ingrid, and then from you, Ron? It really comes down to the, I guess, the clinical resources. I, I did have a query um, in Australia and it was a, a female doctor. She has a, a curious history. I think when you're in the medical profession, you have it. Uh, she has an 18 month wait 
to have a privately funded genetic testing, the cost of which is coming in at sort of a couple of thousand dollars for a test. So that's the availability of, of privately funded um, in Australia and New Zealand, I think with the the availability is perhaps even slightly less from what I could see. I'll, I'll, default, I'll defer to you on that, <laughs> that Rob. So it's, it really does come down to, and it's not just the test result, it has to be have we got the health resources to then the genetic counsellors to do the further testing, to do the prophylactic surgery. So it's, it's really where that health system view of genetics becomes really important. So it's not about being behind, it's about being what we can accommodate to make sure that we're not leaving customers, people, um, with, with these you know, unknowns over their heads around what it could mean for them. Yeah, I'll just expand that a little bit and in the area of research, which is the one I would live in uh, outside the other things I do, and that is that when you're involving people in genetic testing or genetic studies, uh, it's usually they're healthy at the time, you have a sample of their blood, you're able to analyse their DNA, and this has all been appropriately consented, uh, but you don't uh, feed back the results uh, necessarily, or often don't, as part of the research process. And so those sorts of tests are getting done and there's evolution of knowledge around genetic testing, but it doesn't have an impact on insurance or provision of insurance cover. So um, my, one of my concerns that came from the recent review here in New Zealand was, and it's also echoed in Australia, is that in an unregulated environment people aren't being or can't be involved in research, which I would disagree with strongly. And I do want to add that it should still be a person's choice to decide if they want to have the testing. I think it's important to know that while uh, you may have a consultation and a clinician is recommending the testing, do you ultimately want to know, you know, would you look into the future if you could? So I think it's still important that customers know they can have a choice. And uh, like I can speak for our sort of underwriting philosophies, we have those alternatives in there, which is where the result is unknown or where, where someone chooses not to know, um, perhaps look into that fortune. Nice. Um, I've got a question which, sorry, uh, Michael, do you want to ch jump in on that one? Go on. Um, I don't really think you have No, no, good. Okay, cool. Um, so look, I've got a question which is sort of three different things in one, which is challenging, but I'm going to pick on one part of it which talks about, you know, how do we avoid making the mistakes the Australians have made? Uh, and I suppose that begs the question, you know, what mistakes have they made? You know, is, is there anything in terms of the, the current regime that, that we could learn from might be a better way of putting that in Australia? And look, I think it's probably not to call it mistakes, but it's what we can learn from where it could have perhaps been, the things we didn't know about, right? So it was identified that we needed to have data or the information like being recording genetic test results against the final outcomes on life underwriting almost as long as I've been underwriting. But we're now in a world where data is so much more available, right, and much more granular. So some of the questions that are being asked, we don't necessarily have that level of data. And when you're trying to collate that across an entire industry, it's very difficult to do it in a way where the data becomes meaningful. So I think that is, is where you're sort of looking at the parallel pieces um, and trying to put it together. So I guess the point and, and the, the reason why it was raised again around the levels under the current moratorium is exactly what we're having the conversations on today. The cost of living, what is your average mortgage, what would be a right sum insured for someone to be able to access cover without having to disclose a genetic test. So it's, it's not really what went wrong, but what to think about if you're bringing it into this environment and what works. Because we know these things take time um, and, and Rob rightly said, genetics is moving very fast. So it's whatever solution we put in there, it needs to be nimble, it needs to be able to adjust as technology comes in, keeping that health um, outcome at the forefront of, of whatever we decide is, is the right action. Uh, I, I'd like to add to that, Ingrid, and that is that I think what, what the UK have done is more versatile, it involves government and industry, it's not the, um, there's a, a review process uh, built into it. Uh, so I think there are other jurisdictions that have handled this tricky situation better. 
Uh, and I'm led to believe, although I'm not the expert in this, is that the type of insurance cover taken in New Zealand is inherently different to that in Australia as well. And that may have a bearing on the implications of genetics and disclosure of genetic test results. Yeah, and actually what Rob's referring to is the default cover in the group um, insurance, so in the superannuation. So, so Australians, if you're working, contributing to your super, you probably have access to non-underwritten cover. So it's a different starting point um, at, for the, the outset. Nice. I would just add that uh, it's important that we do look at overseas jurisdictions and, and take learnings from them, but uh, to not forget that New Zealand is our own environment and our own economy. Uh, and if I look in health insurance in particular, one of the key differentiation uh, between the two markets is they have portability of pre-existing conditions, uh, for argument's sake, which means as a person moves between insurers, so too their coverage for pre-existing conditions. And that enables a sharing of risk across market. But if you look at the New Zealand market, uh, we don't have near the degree of entities performing in the space. Um, and actually, so we have a role to play as well about propagating access uh, into our public health system uh, as well and supporting that because uh, in lieu of a sustainable private health solution, uh, it puts a lot more pressure into the public health system and that can result in adverse health outcomes as well. So I think we have to look at it very closely in terms of our market and our market's uh, resilience and readiness to, uh, for, for any change in legislation. Fantastic. Thanks, Michael. Um, we've reached the point where we have to look at what was published around the insurance contracts bill uh, only yesterday. Uh, we'll forgive you if you haven't read the 115 pages um, from the report in the Finance and Expenditure Committee. This, uh, Troy did, Troy Churton, thank you Troy, so, and found this. Let's go. This is an excerpt from the report and we might just give you a moment to have a look at that and then I shall turn and ask each of our panel to help us perhaps unpack that. And we're certainly not trying to think about how we might respond to this or develop policy on the fly, but more just to understand you know, how, you know, what kind of flexibility this cautionary approach gives us. Uh, and, and I very much appreciate the timing of the committee to release this the night before the conference. Uh, either late night or early morning, depending on your perspective and preference. Um, look, what I, what I inferred from it was, uh, first, it, it's probably the right outcome. Um, inherently it feels that way. I think we agree that uh, it's, it's an appropriate topic and an important topic for the industry to look at into. Um, in concert with government. But on the same token, the thing that we're always keen to avoid is what I de de uh, deem as knee-jerk legislation. Um, because it's a highly emotive topic, we hear the consumer perspective often and loudly, um, you know, through various media outlets, and uh, the story is very real. It's real people with real impacts and outcome. Um, but as you've heard today and from some of our answers, I think what we need to balance that against is um, that we have an industry that supports great health outcomes and great wellness outcomes for people as well that needs to be sustainable. Um, and when you look at our collective membership, uh, you know, the, the vast majority of those members don't actually have any genetic predisposition. Um, and yet, as, as we are not-for-profit, um, you know, we, we're not uh, providing dividend to shareholders, we're reinvesting that um, into our members' claims. And so are they prepared to, um, to take on that responsibility of the risk and have their premiums um, uh, impacted as a consequence? And I think that's part of the balance that we want to ensure is fleshed out. So we're supporting good outcomes across all of our members, not just a small percentage of our members. And so what I infer from the release um, uh, overnight was to say, yes, we recognise it's a very important issue facing New Zealanders. Yes, we want to engage and have a conversation with it. Uh, we're not prepared uh, to, to just push that in um, and, and enforce a change without great understanding of, of what both sides of that, um, that, that story look like. And so uh, it does reserve the right for the Governor-General to introduce change upon recommendation by the Minister. Um, but following a full and, and comprehensive consultation with industry, which we absolutely welcome because, uh, you know, as, as we mentioned earlier, there are parts of genetics that actually um, benefit our existing policyholders. Um, and so we just want to make sure their rights are protected as well uh, in it. So uh, we think it's actually a very satisfactory outcome. We look forward to that engagement.
I don't have much to add to that other than it's also that window of opportunity to get it in. If it hadn't been included, when would be the next time? And we know it is a topic that's moving fast. So yeah, pleased to see it included, Rob. Well, when I heard that this uh, select committee was meeting and the submissions needed to be made, there was a general sense uh, in the industry that genetic testing wouldn't make it onto the forum. Uh, and boy, did we get that wrong, or did the industry get that wrong, and not only made it on the forum, it made you know, front page news, and it is now part of the current debate. So I think it's a wake up call to the industry not to sit around on their hands anymore. I know Adrian is here, who was one of the people involved in that working group in its earliest stages, and put out the call that the industry get on with it, get some decisions made early, be proactive, and I think if we don't see this um, as another warning cry to get on with it and to start finding and making uh, solutions or suggesting solutions that we think are reasonable and balanced and reflect other jurisdictions, um, then I think we're missing an opportunity and we'll get steamrolled. So it is time for action and I think this demonstrates it. And I, I, know, I, I know that you know the industry and, uh, has put a lot of effort into sort of understanding the issue and I think that it, it, it requires you know a time and effort to understand it so I was I was you know very pleased to see that a cautionary approach was being taken um, there was some definitions I don't want to put anybody on the spot if anybody feels comfortable talking about the definitions that were included in the report that would be handy otherwise I'll go to one of these questions so the definitions I think you're referring to as genetics and yeah what, what constitutes the genetic test yes yeah, look, I th well, well, the decision that was made, as I understand it, was they've taken the Canadian version of that, uh, and that's suitably broad. It, it, it's not contentious, particularly, but the danger is, is that you spend time debating it, uh, because that's time lost. Uh, and already we've, uh, I think the select committee has saved everybody a lot of time by just saying, look, this is what a genetic test is get on with it, sort it out, figure out how you think this should be regulated uh, and come back and come back with you know, sensible submissions. So I welcome that and I don't have a problem with it uh, and I sure as hell don't want to spend any time debating the definition. We need a far more direct approach to solving the challenges ahead. Yeah, and a couple of the questions sort of reflect on and ask us to reflect on the difference between prohibit and regulate. You know, and um, there is an opportunity, obviously, with this mechanism that we can have effective regulation. And one of the things that you mentioned that I thought was particularly interesting was the ability to have review processes built in. Um, prohibit sounds like we've made one decision and it's done forever. Yeah, yeah I mean, and, and the alternative is ban or regulate, and it's a similar kind of argument. You really don't want the ban option because it closes all doors. It's very... Uh, unadaptive, you end up with something that becomes unwieldy and you also are in danger of the unintended consequence of making decisions like that uh, and they play out eventually and you realise what a terrible mistake that might have been or was. So yeah, I think uh, regulate, um, pro prohibit is probably too strong a term, I think there are ways that we can solve this, I think there needs to be external review. Uh, like I say, the British system seems to allow for that and to bring data to the table. Uh, and as a scientist, data is king. Data is what you use to overcome bias. So if the genetics testing community are saying, all oh, my clients tend to taking genetic tests are uh, having trouble with insurance, my challenge to them is to show me the data whereby you sample your entire community or at least the first hundred people and ask them have they had a problem getting insurance or has this impacted on their insurance? Because without that sort of data, you are just telling stories of um, people being disgruntled. Yeah, someone came to me and said I had a problem getting insurance or I got a bum deal or whatever. And that's not really terribly useful scientific data. I like the point that um data helps us overcome bias. And that's definitely something that's a priority for us in terms of maximizing good consumer outcomes for the largest number of people. Um, uh, Michael, did you want to jump in on that point? Just yeah. probably to emphasize that point about uh, regulation, because I think uh, 
What we have ascertained through this Financial Services Council working group is there is probably a lot of misinformation in market, both around the effect on underwriting of genetic data uh, and also what we underwrite. Um, so I mentioned earlier the effect of an exclusion for the genetic defect in itself doesn't necessarily preclude cover for a developed condition. And likewise, not all insurers, and, and I can certainly speak this is true for the Health Society, underwrite every genetic mutation as well. Um, the number would boggle the mind, and really what we're concerned about is the materiality of it. So it's affect the likelihood of developing a condition over population averages. So it's actually a very small number that we have uh, any genuine concern over. Um, I've got three questions now, and I think that they all centre around this issue of how prevalent will testing be and what will be the downstream consequences of that. But I'm going to give you um, sort of the first of those Oh no, we'll contrast these scenarios. So one is, for example, an assumption that genetic testing will be incentivised for those um, whose family histories of illness or you know, disease suggest that genetic tests would be useful. And then we might contrast that with more widespread testing regimes. So for example, um, testings, uh, testing performed on embryos um, on a larger scale, and then, for example, if governments embrace and drive wider population um, testing to inform macro decisions around public health care. So, you know, how might the, especially those more widespread testing scenarios affect our views? Well, I would start and say, and, and I did have some conversations with the Actuaries Institute in Australia where during the, the consultation period, and really, if it becomes widespread and everybody does it and it's the norm, anti-selection goes down. So then you should be able to look to a portfolio and ultimately see improved financials for everyone, right? It's, it's the win-win. So it's really that immediate part about what people know they're not telling us and anti-selecting into our products. So it's probably that interim phase until it becomes broad enough or accessible enough and affordable enough for people to get safely get, so that's with everything they need to know, safely get the testing. So I'll start there. You. If I just comment on the first part of your question, Russell, which was relating to the genetic testing in the context of family history, is yeah. that right? The, I mean, that's common, I suppose, now. It, and it is common, and it's exactly how the medical community operates. We, I teach students about taking family history. It's a core part of anybody's medical history, and it identifies or flags issues, medical conditions that run in families, and particularly when they run often in first-degree relatives and the onset of diagnosis or development of disease is young, it raises the possibility. Now, while that may be... Uh, positive in many people, there are only a limited number of genetic tests that answer the question, you know, what is the gene in that family? And that's a, um, it's a much smaller group. Nonetheless, the family history is still highly relevant. The genetic testing part of that, though, 50% uh, of the time will take someone from a high risk into a low risk category. So there's an advantage already that's lost if genetic testing is completely unavailable in the underwriting process. So I share Ingrid's comments about that kind of reverse discrimination. Um, in terms of the wider uptake of genetic testing outside the context of uh, family history that's suggestive of a familial tendency, uh, I think the jury has to be out there. The uptake of genetic testing and things like direct-to-consumer testing has really been a less than ancestry. People are more interested in knowing who their relatives are than who, what they're going to die from or what diseases they may have. Uh, so that's a really interesting concept. But those direct-to-consumer tests are generally very weak in telling you useful information, particularly ones that rely on single mutations for a disease. The increment increase is tiny. The only other thing I'd like to, to, to comment on is that in the current context of underwriting those who carry genetic mutations with what we call high penetrance or high predictability is what we're finding is when somebody has those mutations they are at these high risks um, of say breast cancer uh, that uh, Michael's talked about uh, but actually there's a whole lot of other things that they're at risk of that go with those same mutations and that story is being unraveled and at present for good or bad, the industry is ignoring that information. And so in doing so, 
those people are still having coverage for a genetic risk that is small increment increase, but for a cancer totally uh, seemingly unrelated or at least not specific to what we currently think about. So that's the complexity of genetic testing. There's already a kind of uh, means with which the industry is sharing the risk across the insurance pool just by the mere nature of, of the current approach. Nice. We're running down the clock, so maybe just one or two more questions. Um, while I ask these, if you've got a last burning question that you'd like to ask, please pop it through. Um, there's, I, I think these are about the question of choice, and I'm, I'm thinking about you, Ingrid, saying that it was important that consumers be able to choose, and of course in the case of uh, a baby that's born after a genetic test that was done you know, on, you know, while they were in utero, you know, they didn't get a choice around that, um, and so there's a question of you know, the results potentially being available, you know, and it wasn't their choice to have that. And I suppose that would be the case too with any wider testing program that government might engage in as well. And um, I think it's probably important for us to reflect at this point that simply because that wouldn't necessarily be a problem for underwriting, that doesn't indicate any support for it from the panel necessarily. Depends what the purpose is. But, um, but yeah, what about that question of choice in terms of, you know, having obtained a test or not or data being available? Well, I guess, and, and we do have products in market that are for children, um, so it would really come down to what that project product does. And you know, it is quite often you'll find there's exclusions for hereditary conditions within within them because of, I guess, the time periods for which they actually start to show symptoms. Um, I guess if they were diagnosed with a condition, right? Like we're still not going away from having to tell us about a condition that you've been diagnosed with. The, we'll know that the genetic test happened and what the result was simply by saying, I have cystic fibrosis, right? So we still just go back to being able to, to underwrite on that information. So look, we, what does the future look like and what sort of testing they'll be able to do in utero? I think it also raises much more probably moral conversations um, for people on choice before it gets to, even gets to insurance's <laughs> problem. It's a tricky one. I'd, I, wouldn't be able to answer And we'll just more. stick with you. Just our last word um, from each of you would be, what do you think our work program entails as we go from here, given the opportunity that's been presented by the report back from the select committee and where we've got to? Yeah. I think the work program will, it will just be important to, to keep up the pace. I think even like when we talk about the one of the solutions to have a review process and be able to do it, have multiple stakeholders do it in a consultative way, we really run the risk of genetics outrunning us. So how can we balance getting the best outcomes but still keeping up that pace so that we are as in front as we can be um, is what I would say for, for how we position it and how we work to get the right outcome. Rob. Yeah, I'll just reiterate what I've said already, which is we need to get a wriggle on big time and we need to propose a alternative, a, a reasonable and alternate acceptable regulated environment uh, and solution to this issue. Uh, certainly inactivity and doing nothing is, is, is going to be a very bad way to proceed. We have to move rapidly to find a solution and I still believe the UK have at this point in time probably present the best alternate uh, for this. Nice. Michael. Thank you. I think uh I think the, the lasting thought I'd give is, yes, it's an appropriate area to put our attention to, um, you know, underwriting for genetic tests. Equally, we have applicants join us with physical health impediment and mental health impediment, uh, and there is uh, discrimination or disadvantage, if you want to use that terminology, that applies to all sets of health, not just genetic health. And so I think we just need to make sure that whatever outcome we land on results in a fair, equitable and sustainable industry, because that's the outcome that our consumers are demanding. I love that answer. That's our aim, to find a fair, equitable and sustainable solution to you know, these current challenges and there are always underwriting challenges that face us. Thank you so much to all of our panel. Thank you very much for joining us and a reminder that there's an ongoing work program that the FSC has in this area and if you're interested in that, please let it be known to one of the FSC folks if you'd like to join one of those uh, teams. Thank you very much.